Good morning. Good morning. As, uh, as we get started this morning, just a quick uh, reminder, as you heard the announcement this morning, I um, just want to make sure that you're aware there is dinner provided this evening at the kickball game. It's a, a barbecue and some uh, treats and plenty of snacks and chips and other things. So as you come tonight, come hungry uh, and ready to fellowship, enjoy kickball, time together with your church family, uh, and yeah, all of those things. Uh, as we gather for this morning, I, it is a sweet morning that the Lord has prepared for us to gather in His Word. Uh, as has already been mentioned, we're going to be starting into one of the more famous chapters in all the pages of Scripture. That is most well known. There are multiple names that have been given to it, but the one that most seems to fit is the Hall of Faith. The Hall of Faith, that is found in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, and in this section we come to the heart of the transition that we spoke of last week, where the author is, has transitioned from proving and exhorting and warning about Christ and trusting in him as God's provision for our salvation, to straight encouraging and teaching. And that's what we're going to see through the conclusion of this, where, where he's walking through these things. And, and we come to this section, and I want us to see so many things. And, and Lord willing, we will in the, in the weeks ahead. We're, we're only going to get through the first three verses this morning. But certainly one of the things that I would point out to us just in coming to this section is there's a picture throughout this book of how we ought to be dealing with one another. When one comes to Christ, we, we should rejoice absolutely and fully. We rejoice in their faith and their trusting in Christ. We, we exhort them in what that means and what, what the newness of their life will look like. We warn and we rebuke, not all in a single day. This is over the course of time. But, but in someone's life, these things are happening and we teach and we train. And this is a picture of how it ought to be in the body of Christ. As we've said before, I believe the book of Hebrews is actually a sermon that was recorded. That it's maybe a series of sermons, but it's a singular author bringing forth a singular text and, and making a very singular point uh, as he does so. And as we come in these things, this, this chapter on faith, this is not a set-apart chapter. I fear sometimes that when there's really well-known uh, sections of Scripture that we tend to set them apart, like Psalm 23, uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And what we end up doing is setting them apart in such a way that we miss what they actually have given us. This chapter is not set apart from the rest of Hebrews for our consideration. But it is simply an essential section in the flow of the rest of the book and what's being taught to us. Again, this is the natural transition chapter. I would put it in this way. This is the section that begins for the survivors, so to speak, of the first 10 chapters. And if you've been with us in our study of those 10 chapters, you understand what I mean by that. There has been a continual proving and exhortation that Christ is the only means by which we can be made right with God. There's nothing else. There, there's no angel. There's no, there's no patriarch. There's no uh, wonderful, godly man who can accomplish these things in our life. We've seen that through Moses and Joshua. We've seen that through the angels. We've seen that through the priesthood. We've seen that through the law as each has been raised up and then laid against Christ and found to be woefully insufficient compared to him. And mixed in the midst of it is, as these things are being proven, as these things are being proclaimed, there is a choice that must be made. If Jesus is who the author of Hebrews has portrayed him to be, then you have to either trust in him by faith or reject him by faith. And those warnings, we saw the final one in, in chapter 10, the, the fifth and, and final grave warning of the book of Hebrews. And, and we've just walked through that. And this is what we have to understand. This, this is the section for those who survived that. Those who have come through and said, I do trust. I think oftentimes of, of the one who cries out, I, I believe, help my unbelief. That's what we're going into now. Okay, you, you believe. You, you have trusted in Christ. You have seen the proclamation and the provenness of who he is. And now 
we're going to help your unbelief. We're going to encourage, we're going to teach, we're going to train, we're going to exhort in all the goodness that comes with our faith. And that's what we see, right? The, everything that we've seen has been by faith. Think about this. It, certainly for us, and we've even had to labor to go back in our understanding to, to catch up to the recipients, the original recipients of this letter, the, the Hebrews who were just in that first generation of transition from the law of Moses into the, the law of Christ or into uh, what we recognize as the new covenant coming out of the old covenant. So we've had to go back. We don't really uh, have a strong grasp this many years removed on the sacrificial system, on the priesthood, on those elements that are being described here. And so we've had to go back. But it was not really a great deal different for them. I mean, think about this. Everything that has been laid out has been done according to faith. Because even the original recipients of this epistle to the Hebrews, they were not there when the world and its order were established regarding all created things, including angels. They were not a part of that. They were not witnesses of it. They were not there when Moses and then Joshua were leading the Israelites. None of them were eyewitnesses of those things. They were, they were trusting in the word of God that gave them the account and detail of that. They were not there when Abraham and Melchizedek met. They were not there when David, King David in the Spirit, penned Psalm 110 and verse 4, teaching about what it, what it means that, that there will be a priest like Melchizedek that's coming. These were all presented as truths that are received by faith, pointing to the ultimate faith or the ultimate truth for our faith. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what all of those were pointing toward. That's what all of those were laying foundations for. The law was a tutor to point us to Christ. And so the author is simply saying, remember these things that you do trust and understand what their intent was. We just saw this in the last chapter. There, there are those who have rejected faith in God for faith in something less. Certainly this is a common occurrence. Certainly we, we are prepared for this. Jesus himself said that there's a narrow road. And there are few that are upon such a road as that. And there's a broad way that leads to destruction. And behold, there are many upon that. There, there's always this understanding that there will be those, uh, even that there will be those who are in the majority who reject faith in God to instead pursue faith in something less. And there are those who by faith in God have received his commands and his promises. And then we go forth into this understanding more of what that means. Because Understand, so for any believer, we are called to faith. As a matter of fact, this is a very common term in Christianity. When I throw out the term faith, it, it would be like if we were some type of living back in the 60s and, and, and we were all hippies and barefoot and I used the word peace, right? Everyone would, would instantly, oh, that's my word. I know that word. That's why I'm here, right? In the same way for Christianity, faith well, it is the foundation of who we are. It's a very common term. We must accept by faith. We must walk or live by faith. Faith is continually on display throughout the pages of Scripture. It's commanded. It's exhorted. It's described. It's detailed. It's exampled. Faith is the essence of who we are as believers. But what is sadly true is that so many hear words and they just assume that, oh, I know what that means. And that they're already acting correctly based on their assumptions of what something means. I love the section that Brother Larry read earlier from, from Job. And, and, and it actually began back in Job 38. I mean, technically it began in Job uh, chapter 1 and 2. When we see God laying this tribulation upon Job's shoulders. And then for, for multiple chapters of Job's handling of it and his friend's interaction and those things. And, and finally we get to chapter 38 and, and Job questions the Lord. And certainly there's a part of us, if you're familiar with Job, that you think, man, he, he did so much better than I would have done. I mean, truly, when, when you think through what it was like for Job to come under these things, apart from any sin in his own life that was on display, he just had nowhere to turn. Right? He couldn't correct what he hadn't done wrong. He couldn't repent of those things which he didn't know. But then, at the end of it, he finally questions the Lord. What am I supposed to do? And the Lord responds. And the Lord responds. And, and we heard that even as Brother Larry was reading that earlier. And, and it's interesting because what the Lord is saying to Job is, you, you don't understand. Will the fault finder 
contend with the Almighty? Okay, you want to go there, Job? Let's go there. And that's what you see in chapter 38 and then into 40. Let him who reproves God answer this. Then Job answered the Lord and said, whoa, whoa, whoa I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I, because at this point, right, in Job chapter 38, there's already been, right, if you see this, how did God approach Job? In a whirlwind. God spoke to Job from the storm. I don't know exactly what that means, but I know it's something that's awe-inspiring. I can tell you that. And it, it did that to Job because Job's response was, Behold, I am insignificant. I am insignificant. And then it goes on. It says, I have spoken and I will not answer. Once I have spoken, even twice, I will add nothing more. But the Lord's not done. The Lord answered Job out of the storm and said, Now gird up your loins like a man. I will ask you and you instruct me. Will you really annul my judgment? In other words, the simplicity of what we're seeing at the conclusion of Job is the Lord reminding Job who he is. Both who Job is and who God is. And we need that sometimes. We need that. We need to redefine ourselves because so many times we have this, oh, I'm a Christian. Really? Well, what does that mean? I have faith. Really? In what? How is this faith on display? What is your faith doing in your life? Is it biblical faith? Is it statistical faith? Is it historical faith? What, what does it mean that you have faith? And there's so many things like that that we've just begun to presume grace. Oh my goodness, grace is unmerited favor. And we certainly live in a time where we've come to believe that we deserve grace, which is an absolute denial of what grace is. And it's such a mess. And this is an example. There, there's multiple ones. Think of the word love. Love's a great example. Love's a very common term. We use it all the time. We, we use it continually. And, and I have to confess to you, I am so tired in my heart. I'm so saddened how often I hear this amazing truth abused. Well, I mean, I, st I still love them, Pastor. I just don't want to be with them. Okay, then you don't love them. All right, let's be clear. We don't get to redefine, and, and, and that might be the case. There may be a, a, a righteous biblical reason why you no longer love that person. It could be. There are a few given, but we don't get to call it something it's not. We don't get to confuse it as though it is when it's not. Love is defined singularly in a singular way. And if you love them, you love them. And if you don't love them, then you don't love them. And if you ought to love them and you don't love them, then you need to labor to love them as you ought. But what we don't get to do is say we love them, redefine the word, and then go on about our lives as though somehow we've accomplished the very thing. And then we wonder, why is this not going the way Scripture said? Why am I not experiencing these things? And that's what God's saying to Job. Listen, Job, you, you think you can annul my judgments? You want to negotiate peace with me? You want to have it in accordance to how you want it? He says, okay, then if that's what you want, here's what you have to do, Job. Adorn yourself with eminence and dignity and clothe yourself with honor and majesty. Okay, I can do that maybe. Oh, and then by the way, pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and make him low. Look on everyone who is a proud and humble him. And tread down the wicked where they stand, Job. Hide them in the dust together. Bind them in the hidden place. Then, when you have done that, Job, then I will also confess to you that your own right hand can save you. But in the meantime, Job, you are dependent on me for salvation. You are dependent upon me for hope. And you better be careful the way you're speaking. Because you are speaking without understanding. You are standing before the God who created these things, who controls these things, who is sovereign over whether the raven babies get fed and where the mountain goats give birth. And Job, you better remind yourself in this moment where you are. And Job says, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I am reminded. I am thankful. Lord, forgive me. And we need those moments. Job, none of us are as righteous as Job in our own endeavors and pursuits. To be clear, in our own ability, Job is amazing. Job is, is beyond amazing. That in a, in a place of unrighteousness, when, when Satan comes before the Lord, the Lord says, if you consider Job, like let, let me just hold up this man who is, who is stalwart, this man who is, who is a man of God. Have you considered him, Satan? I mean, I just think about that scene. And to consider that Job, in all of his righteousness when he was struck with plagues that you and I cannot even begin to fathom 
In the span of about 30 seconds, Job's servants came to him and reported the loss of all of his earthly possessions and the death of his entire family, save his wife, who her response was, you ought to just curse God and die. That's Job's life in the book of Job. In the book of Job, that's Job's life. And Job says, naked I came from the womb, naked I shall return, blessed be God. Shall I receive good things only and not uh, difficult things as well? Right? This is Job. And that's what I want you to understand because that's who God's speaking to that we read earlier. That's, that's who God's speaking to in chapter 38. And if that man who in chapter 2 said, blessed be the name of the Lord in the face of tragedy that we cannot fathom, needed to be reminded of who God is and who he is, then so too does every one of us on a regular basis, on a continual basis. I, I want to be reminded of this. I want to be laid low. I want to be humbled so that I never forget, blessed be the name of the, God, the, name of the Lord. And blessed be the God and Father. Blessed be Christ, my Savior. I never want to get to a place where I don't, I don't find myself humbled by grace. I never want to get to a place where I find myself presuming upon forgiveness. It's a dangerous place to be. It's a place that we would never want to be. And so we want to understand these things. And, and, when, we still think in, and when we think in terms of the words that are given, I love, I still love them, but I just don't want to be. We need to understand what does this word mean? What does this truth mean? And he tells us. Ephesians 5 says so specific for husbands, this is what it means. For wives, this is what it means. It, it, it tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, for love in general, if you're going to use that word, it means you better be striving to do so in accordance with the definition that was given. Love is a choice. For goodness sakes, if it's an emotion, then we're all justified in all the foolishness that goes on around. If it's just about how we feel in the moment, then Sure. I love them, I don't love them, I kind of love them, I, I like them a little bit, I don't, I don't know what I do, but, but you know, there's still some, and it's just confusing. And if you think it's confusing for you, you, you ought to see how confused your children are, trying to figure these things out. And so in all of this, we want to define it rightly. We need to understand, well, what does this actually mean then, and only then, can we examine ourselves and decide if we are living appropriately according to the command to love one another, the command to walk by faith, the command to, to trust in the Lord by faith unto salvation. And so for believers who are intimately familiar with the term and the commands and the exhortation to faith, what is the logical and absolutely necessary question we ought to be asking? Well, what is faith? What is it? How do I know if I've got it? Maybe, maybe I've got some version of it that's not this version. Right? Maybe I've got some version of it, and I know I'm supposed to have it. I do believe that, that most who profess Christ believe that they're supposed to have faith. More than that, I believe that most who profess Christ would agree that they're supposed to live their lives according to their faith. Well, can we not understand logically and just in general that if that's true, then that demands an accurate definition. I don't want to live my life for something that's not accurate. And thankfully, the author who has just reminded us and called us to live by it is happy to give us that. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 down to 3. And there's so much, this whole chapter is about faith. And so we're going to be in this subject. And there's things that, that I would maybe include in this, this message today that I'm saving for future messages. So if there's something you think that's missing, it probably will be picked up in the weeks ahead. But let's start with these first three verses. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the men of old gained approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Now, probably a familiar three verses. You probably have heard those verses or some version of them, some semblance of them. You probably have them in your mind. Oh, I know, I know these. I know what this is talking about. And as I said before, th this is a natural transition chapter. And sadly, many set it apart as a standalone chapter. And, and what I will say to you is, apart from what's gone before and what will follow after, this chapter will not make sense as it was intended. It is a magnificent chapter to be sure. 
It is with the proper understanding of its context before and after, one that by itself can bring the greatest comfort, the greatest direction, the greatest teaching, the greatest exhortation. By itself, it can do that. But to understand it rightly, we have to see it in the flow of the author's writing. We have to see it in the flow of the author's thought as he was giving it. Back just a few verses ago at the conclusion of chapter 10, the author loosely quoted Habakkuk in the great exhortation at the end of Hebrews 10. We looked at this just recently, last week and the week before. Quickly, just consider, you may not be familiar with Habakkuk. You probably maybe didn't read him this week. It's three chapters. I encourage you, you should go and read Habakkuk. Uh, but, but quickly, I want to just consider why he said what he said. So you don't have to turn there. I'm not even going to quote too much from there. But there's a few things I want us to consider. In Habakkuk chapter 1, the prophet Habakkuk, he's a prophet of God. He, he cries out to the Lord uh, regarding his, his people Judah and their wickedness. These people that you have sent me to with your words, they, they are wicked, O oh Lord. They do not listen. They do not obey. They are, they are not even, they don't look like your people at all. What are you going to do about this? And the Lord responds. And he responds with a plan to bring judgment against Judah at the hands of the Chaldeans. A pagan and very fierce, a ruthless and, and bloodthirsty group of, of people. Now Habakkuk, hearing the Lord's plans, he immediately responds with, Oh no. And he even speaks to the Lord and says, Surely this cannot be your plan, O Lord. Why? Because it makes no sense to me. That's his response if we, were to, if we were to summarize it. Lord, this can't be your plan because it makes no sense to me. How can you, O oh God, whose character I know, how can you prosper a group of pagan infidels at the cost of your own people called by your name? God, that doesn't make sense. It cannot be. Right? And we've seen this before. Peter speaking to Christ. Oh, you, you'll never be crucified. And Jesus said, get thou behind me, Satan, for you are not helping me in my commitment to the plans of the Father. In the same way, that's what Habakkuk says. He's saying, listen, hey, oh no, surely this cannot be your plan because it makes no sense to me. And the Lord replies to him. In chapter 2, he spends that time reminding Habakkuk as we saw him in, with Job. But in a more broad degree, he reminds Habakkuk of the wickedness of the people. Right? What Habakkuk originally came to him about, the Lord says, Look, remember this. And more specifically, he reminds Habakkuk who he, the Lord, is. Who, just like Job experienced. And specifically in verse 4, he says this of chapter 2. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. But the righteous will live by his faith. And that's what we saw quoted. We come to chapter 3, by the way, and Habakkuk is now responding. He's responding to this confrontation from the Lord. And he does so, he responds by praising him. All of chapter 3 is Habakkuk just recounting praise unto the Lord the Almighty. And he concludes with these three verses in chapter 3. And I love this because this is what Habakkuk is saying. Lord, as you bring this, I know it's going to be devastating. Right? This is your plan. It's going to be devastating. Verse 17, though the fig tree should not blossom. And there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Welcome to what it means the righteous will live by faith. He will live by faith. For the Lord God is my strength. He has made my feet like hind's feet, and he makes me to walk on my high places. Lord, although the plan is painful, and surely not my plan, yet I will trust in you, O God of my salvation. This is a continual reality in the New Testament as well, as the Lord calls the twelve to follow him by faith, to stay with him by faith. It's not as though things went smashingly well, and to go forward without him by faith. Right? You have trusted in God. Believe also in me and live your life accordingly. Throughout the epistles, we are told to live or walk by faith. And in three places, this 
quote from Habakkuk 2 and verse 4 is explicit. Romans 1 and verse 17. For in it, the righteousness of God, in it being the gospel, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 11, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. And again, in the chapters, the verses just prior to chapter 11 where we're at in verse 38 of Hebrews 10, but my righteous one shall live by faith, verse 38. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So what I want us to understand is it is perfectly in the flow of the author's thought and intention that this chapter on faith comes next. This chapter on the foundation that, is, that has been from the Old Testament forward on how we are to live our lives as those who have trusted in the God of the Bible, the God of creation, as those who have trusted in him and whatever epic that we were in, it still comes back to that by faith we live our lives. And so this is a wonderful chapter in the flow of understanding that. And the understanding of what it means that we are not those who shrink back, but rather who by faith live lives accordingly. And by, as we have seen, this is how his righteous ones live. By faith. Now, to be clear, there's no one here who would willingly, if they understood the fullness of what it means, desire to be an unrighteous one. Right? And no one would want to stand before the Lord clothed in their unrighteousness. Because his wrath shall be poured out upon those who do such as that. And so to be clear, my righteous one is something that all of us, I pray each of us here, are in fact, by the blood of Christ, righteous ones. And if you are that, then you will know that you are that because God says if you are, you'll live by faith. Period. That, that's the, the, the declaration that's on display here. This is how his righteous ones live. How does one who is righteous live? By faith. This is how we're to live our lives. These three verses are the foundation for our Christianity. I could even say to you, well, these three verses are the foundation for our faith. And you would probably know immediately that I'm describing our Christianity. If I said, well, our faith, you would know I'm talking about Christianity. It's the foundation for who we are. These three verses are the foundation for that. They are biblical understanding of our faith. In other words, we better get this one right. Of all the things that we can maybe get wrong, faith is not one of them. You don't want to be distorted, aberrant, missing it by a hair. You don't want to get this one wrong. And we're not, there's no reason to. God himself in his word has given us absolute and great clarity in this. This is God's definition of the faith he demands that we live by. That he declares that we shall live by. These three verses tell us what is most important about our faith. It tells us, number one, what faith is. These are our three points. They're very simple. What faith is, what faith does, and what faith is in. That's it. That's the summary of, of what our faith is intended. It's a very simple outline for a very important topic. God has declared these things to be true. And believe me, you and I do not want to be standing before God in the whirlwind of his judgment, in the righteous throne room of his wrath, and declaring, oh, but God, I thought I was not insignificant, and I thought that I could in all your judgments, and, and we just don't want to be there. So this is a very important topic. Let's start with what faith is. Let's get this right. Let's understand this. So that we who, as his righteous ones, want to live by this, we ought to know what it is. Faith is, as we said earlier, we have to get this part right or else we can work very hard at doing something only to find out that that something is the wrong thing. And this happens all the time. Here's God's definition of faith. Verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Right? And, and that word now means it's building out of the conclusion of chapter 10. It's building out of that, of that uh, summary of Habakkuk and that declaration that we're not those who shrink back under destruction. But those who by faith preserve our souls. Which, by the way, is way more important than anything else you have. When you stand before the Lord in judgment, you will give up every comfort 
you will, you will cut off every limb. You would do anything that you could possibly do to annul his judgment if you find yourself under the hand of his judgment. Whatever it is that distracted you, that drew you away from trusting in him here, you would forsake it a thousand, a million times over in that moment. And that's why we see this. Listen, it's a terrifying thing, chapter 10, to fall into the hands of the living God. But for those who have by faith trusted in the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, we now call him Abba Father. We now can stand before him clothed in the righteousness of the one in whom we've trusted and not be condemned. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But there is still condemnation for those who are not in Christ Jesus. That's the point. And so now faith is the assurance. Let's stop there for a moment and define that word. Now Merriam-Webster says that assurance is being certain in the mind. Being certain in the mind. And I think that's a good working definition. I think that assurance is the better translation of that. There, there's multiple ways that that word has been translated in multiple translations. But I think assurance is, is accurate. And so Merriam-Webster says that, well, assurance is being certain in the mind. So we could say now faith is being certain in the mind of things hoped for. Okay. This brings two things to the table for our consideration. First of all, what are the things hoped for? Right? You can be certain in your mind of things hoped for, but what if they're not the things that we ought to be hoping for? Right? What if we're convinced, if we're certain, and that's what we're calling our faith. Oh, I have faith. I have, I have tons of, I have more faith than many others. I'm living by my faith. I'm living certain of the things which I'm hoping for. But what are, what are the things hoped for? better life? Um, where do we find that both promised and example? Right? It is in there, but the better life, what is exactly does it mean and not mean? Well, consider the examples all over scripture. What, what does it mean to have a better life under the new covenant? Well, it means that we have peace with God, that we have a peace that passes understanding. It means that we, in the face of great struggle, can let our hearts not be troubled because we believed in Jesus Christ who has gone ahead to prepare a place for us that where he is, we may be with him. In other words, what can man do to me? He can, at his worst, send me to heaven, which is far greater, right? I've been set free from the fear of death, that weapon that Satan has wielded against God's creation all of these years by the the, the trailblazer, Jesus Christ, who has gone ahead of me and passed through the heavens, that as his resurrection is attested to, so too will I be resurrected. What can man do to me? So there is a, a, a better life, but oftentimes when people are pointing to, to their faith, that's not what they're talking about, right? They're, they're talking about, well, well, I'm just trusting in Jesus that he's going to fix this. That he's going he's gonna to correct this. Maybe it's a, a longer life. I'm trusting in Jesus that, that I can have the fullest or longest life possible. Where is that promised according to our faith? He must have really hated Peter and John the Baptist and James. He, he must have really hated those men if the way he shows his love is a long and, and well-experienced life. Because that's not what they had. And that's not what they had, and we wouldn't say that. A successful life? Again, examples. They left their businesses to follow him. And they struggled greatly. And yes, they, they were married and had children and families and those things. And, and they suffered as well for this, by the way. We don't have this biblically factual, but historically, it's recorded that when Peter was crucified, he did so upside down. Many, many know that. But what you may not know is it's also recorded that just prior to Peter's crucifixion, he watched his wife be crucified for her faith also. And I want you to think about that for just a minute. When we think about how much Jesus loved Peter, we believe that. But it did not display itself in these things. And again, so what are we hoping for? A more successful life, a longer life, a better life with the comforts and things of this world? That is not what Scripture promises. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. Let's rather consider what we are told to hope in. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. And there's, 
so many places we could have gone. This is just one of my favorites. It's, it's, it's written to a people who are suffering great persecution. Persecution that we cannot even begin to imagine. He is writing to, to the double diaspora. The, the Jews who by faith have trusted in Christ and have been uh, excommunicated from their own people. They have been cast off by their own families. And now because of their faith and the uh, lunacy of, of Nero, they're now suffering horrible death because of Christ. Because they've trusted in Christ, they're dying. They're, they're, they're being arrested and separated from their earthly possessions and families. And they're being slaughtered. Whether it was in the Colosseum before before animals, whether for sport, whether it was on the cross through crucifixion, whether it was through being dipped in tar and set afire, whether it was through, their, there's hideous things of how they did this. They, they would take and, and sew people up in wet leather. And then as the leather dried, it would slowly constrict and it would take three and four days at times before they were finally suffocated by that. They were, they were faced where they would take a dead and rotting corpse and they would chain it to someone. So as someone was living their life in prison, but as they were living, that corpse was, was just leaking all of the infection and, and horribleness, and they would themselves contract it and die slow and excruciating death. We need to understand who Peter's writing to, right? We need to have an understanding before we just blow through this and think, oh, this is such a wonderful promise. It is. But this is what Peter says to those who are suffering under the hand of Nero in this time, beginning in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a hard thing to write to someone whose husband, wife, children, parents maybe just got torn apart by lions in the Colosseum for sport. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Just, just stop there for a minute. What's our living hope? What's our hope? A living hope. What's it based in? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Therefore, what are we hoping in? Eternity. E eternity, eternal life. It's not only for that, but certainly it's what gives us joy beyond circumstances, joy beyond moments, joy beyond sadness, joy beyond all other things is because there is an eternal inheritance an eternal promise that this world can't touch, that this life can't lose. He goes on and says it, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. He, he doesn't say, well, walk by faith and it's all going to be okay. Walk by faith and, and God's going to provide. There'll be, there'll be some way that he's going he's to provide and you will not have to face the torturer. You will not have to face the executioner. Peter doesn't say that. He says, blessed be the God and Father who has given us an eternal hope, an inheritance that awaits us. Look to that and die well. Look to that and suffer well. That's what he says. He goes on, who are protected by the power of God through faith. Ooh, Maybe, maybe you got it wrong, Pastor. I mean, it just said they're protected by the power of God. Maybe this means that, you know, they can count on the lion's mouths being bound, right? Maybe they'll be able to slip through the crowds like Christ did when they, during his earthly ministry, tried to take him. Maybe the fire will not touch them. It's not what it says. They are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And he goes on, in this you greatly rejoice. You see, if we're going to call it faith, being the assurance of things hoped for, then we better make sure we're hoping for the right things. We better make sure that our faith is causing this hope for these things. In this you greatly rejoice. Wow. Wow. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. You could call them that. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable. Assurance of our salvation is the greatest gift we can receive in the here and now. 
Hey, those moments when we, when we see ourselves on the pages of Scripture and we know by, by the lives that we're living and by the hope that is within us that, that Christ is ours and, and we are His and that we can rest in that no matter what comes, there's not a greater moment. I, I don't care what the economy's doing. I don't care what your health is doing. I don't care what you're experiencing. Oftentimes, the greatest of trials build the greatest of assurance because it rips this world away from us in such a way that we see him most fully. And there's not a greater peace or a greater gift that we can have in this temperamental, temporal life than to be assured in the midst of it that he is our God. In this you greatly rejoice so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold which is perishable even though tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your earthly tent, bank account, big house, small house, comfortable house, white picket fence house, marriage you longed for, grandchildren no the salvation of your souls that's what we hope in that's what we hope for right this is what we need to understand it, what wonderful and magnificent promises we've been given that we look forward to or hope for and then we are told that that faith is the conviction right faith is the conviction now stop again just for a moment Mary Webster says conviction is the state of being convicted the state, the state of being convinced, sorry. The state of being, it means it's, it's the state of who you are, that you are convinced, you, you are in that state. That's who you are. Faith is the state of being convinced of things not seen. So it's assurance of things hoped for and the state of being convinced of things not seen. And people say, oh, right, exactly. That's why we call it faith. Because it's believing in things that we don't see. We kind of have to be careful with that, don't we? Or else we'll be justifying our beliefs in aliens and UFOs and such. And we'll be basing it upon this verse in Scripture. Well, no one's ever seen one, but... Uh, that missing link, and no one's ever found it, but... You know, I, I by faith... No, they would never say that. But that is what they're believing by faith. It's in things not seen. I'm convinced. I live in the state of being convinced. Because God commanded we believe in things we cannot see. Uh, again, what is the state of being convinced actually in? What is it actually in? And as we get into those listed through this amazing chapter, this will become more and more and more abundantly clear by the lives that they lived and the outcomes they experienced. But before we even get to them, let's define our foundational terms rightly. Right, that's what I'm doing in these first three verses is laying the foundation for all that you're going to see when it talks about by faith Moses, by faith Abraham, by faith these men did these things. Well, let's understand what faith is. Let's look briefly. Turn with me back to Romans chapter 1. I want us to understand this idea of conviction in things not seen. Being in a state of being convinced of things not yet seen. Romans is a great place to help us understand this. And again, it, we could go to many, many places. This is just one of my favorites. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 16, a well-known verse. Paul declaring, I am not, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. The gospel, the power of God for salvation to all who believes. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Now, think about this for just a moment. We don't have the parting of the Red Sea. We have the account of the parting of the Red Sea, that those uh, had experienced it, and we by faith based on their faith, recognize those things. We believe these truths. None of us are eyewitnesses to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. None of us were with the ladies at the tomb or the, the crowds in the streets or the disciples themselves who are eyewitnesses 
of the resurrected Christ with our own eyes, but we are believing these things that are the gospel by faith. These are the things which we have not seen. That's what Peter said. Even though you do not see him now, you love him and rejoice with joy inexpressible over Jesus. That's what we need to understand. What is the things not seen? It is the gospel. Those are the things that we can't see. We can believe according to what has been given, but I cannot say to you, I have a video recording of Jesus' resurrection. Let's put it on trial. What I can say to you is eyewitnesses accounts and other things, but at the same time, none of us are those eyewitnesses. It's by faith. What is it that has to be believed in order to be experienced? Because that's the amazing thing about Christ and the gospel. We live in a time that says, well, seeing is believing. Jesus says with all clarity, believing is seeing. Right? That's the reversal of this. Turn with me to chapter 3 of Romans. Beginning in verse 21. You see, they, they, had, a, they had a temple. They had a, an altar. They had a law that said, this is how you do it. They had a priesthood that said, this is how we're going to do it on your behalf according to the things that have been given. They had all of these tangible, this is how I am righteous and live by faith by keeping the law. But listen to verse 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested or made known, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. They were pointing to it. They're witnesses of it. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, meaning all need it, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, being justified in spite of falling short and having sin, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. Now, again, propitiation, the transfer Right, the transfer of these things and understanding, how do, I, how do I show you that? I can't. I can tell you about it. I can declare my own faith in it. I can declare the reasons why it's never been disproven. But I cannot show you the propitiation of Jesus Christ in a way that you can measure it on an x-ray. Right? We can't do that. There's people who tried to do something similar where they would try and take someone in the moments of their death and see if the soul had weight. Right? They would have them on scales and do all these medical tests and have them hooked up and see if at the moment of death something significantly changed that would display the soul leaving the body. Inconclusive in many ways. There, there was a lot of different things on it. But all that to be said, we, we want to see these things. We're waiting for God to part the Red Sea. We're waiting for him to, to put it in PowerPoint in the stars. We're waiting for a dream. We're waiting for you and I, and only you and I can ever know what it is we're waiting for. But he just told us, if you're waiting for something other than the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross, you're waiting for something that will never come. Because he has finished that work. He has completed that work. And if you're waiting for something greater... Chapter 10 and verse 26 says, you have nothing except for the expectation of fiery judgment. It's a terrifying thing. And so in that, we recognize that there is this elements of the gospel that we receive by faith, that we're convinced of. We're in the state of being convinced. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he lived a righteous life. That he was born of a virgin. That he came to bring forgiveness to sinners. Of which I am a deserved sinner. Because my creator is holy. And I have rebelled against him. As have all men. I am undone. I cannot save myself. I cannot array myself in majesty and humble the wicked. I, I cannot do the things that only God can do. And so I have to therefore rely on him for my salvation. I have to trust in him. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Right? That, that God is righteous. He is holy. He is just. That when he justifies the wicked, someone paid the price. Right? He doesn't just look the other way and sweep it under the rug. 
He doesn't say, well, your sins aren't as great as other sins, so therefore you're going to get a pass because you measure up. He says, I'm holy. I demand holiness. Holiness is not possible for sinners. Therefore, sinners are condemned. Sinners deserve my condemnation. Sinners are eternal because I am eternal and created them to be eternal. Therefore, they shall suffer in my justice for eternity. But I love them. And because I love them, I've made a way. And the way that I've made is that I would lay their punishment, their deservedness upon my own son. That all those who would trust in him would receive his righteousness. Can I, can I show you how this functions? Can I, can, I, can I draw you pictures? Can I show you on an x-ray? I can't. I can declare it. And you in your heart can trust it. That's the picture of what we have. That, that this... God who is just and has given us all the, the realities of his justice time and time and time again, warning us and warning us and promising. And then we see that it's fulfilled in Christ, that his righteousness at the present times, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? Well, it's excluded. By what kind of law did you arrive at this? One of works? No. But by a law of faith, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. We want tangible. We want, look what I did. We want, oh, I'm not as bad as my neighbor. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I'm not as bad as, look at what I did. I've accomplished it. Look at me. I, I've done this. It's tangible. I can point to it and say, here's the measurement. Hey, God, your judgment has been annulled because I've come up with a new one. My measurement is that, you know, there's this guy, Hitler, and it's not fair by my standard that I would be in the same place Hitler's at. Therefore, I've rendered and judged myself according to my own standard. And God, who are you to judge me? And we stand on that until that moment when from the whirlwind he will speak to us and we will no longer stand. Sounds like the faith of the Bible is very specific in what we are to be in the state of being convinced about. It's not random. It's not left to debate and conclusion. More on that next, on the next two. But this first one, what we need to understand from verse 1 is that God's righteous one walks by faith. And faith is being convinced in the mind of things hoped for and the state of being convinced of things not yet seen. Now what we also see is in verse 2 what faith does. What faith does, for by it the men of old gained approval. Though this verse is short, it is packed with so much rich truth. Faith brings approval. What does that mean? Whose approval? Well, look just a few verses further in verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. Who's him? For he who comes to God, oh, God is him, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Verse 16, but as it is, speaking of those who have lived by faith, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. There's obvious approval there. Verse 39 and 40, and all these having gained approval through their faith, they did not receive what was promised. Meaning that the promised Messiah, all of these had died prior to his arrival because God had provided something better for us. So that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. God's approval is brought to us through our faith. This is the basis for the rest of the chapter that we're going to be in. Approval through faith. We need to slow down and zoom out for just a minute. What, what is the point of this chapter? What is the point of chapter 11? Because so many just read it and they're like, man, these are just amazing stories of faith that are, that are there to bolster me and strengthen my faith and things. It's, it's more than that. In verse 36 of chapter 10, where we just left from going into this, listen to what, be reminded of what we, what we read. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Endurance for what? Not for heaven. It must be then for this life, endurance for this life. Well, everyone needs that, right? Whether you're a Christian or not, we, we need endurance. This life is not easy. It has its ups and downs and difficulties and all those things. Everyone needs endurance, right? Wrong. This is a very specific endurance. Living this life by faith is a righteous one of God in a world that is contrary and therefore not worthy of him or you. That's what we're going to see throughout chapter 11. And in chapter 12, this is called the race. 
There's a specific thing that is given to a Christian upon their salvation. It is that the starting gun has gone off and they now live their life according to their faith, which means they're running their race that is set before us. And what we're told is that we have a great cloud of witnesses who have gone before and that they have set an example to strengthen and spur us on in our race. To be clear, and we'll cover this more fully, this is not them and others cheering us on from heaven. If that's your view of this, it is a warped view that Scripture does not bear out. Simply put, all of this is clear that we are not the first to run this race. Take heart. Others have gone before and they finished well. They finished strong, and so therefore too can you. Many others have run it before us, and they have set an example for us to follow after. I need that a lot. I don't know about you, but I need that a lot. I need to know that there have been others to go through this life by faith and not quit. I need to know that there have been others who have faced way worse than what I faced. And they made it. I need to be renewed in that confidence because my flesh is weak. My flesh is weak and I need this a lot. I need to know that there have been others who have accomplished this. And I need the example of Moses and Abraham and Joshua and David and Peter and Paul. I need to be reminded of these frail and failing men who, who denied Christ and, and did foolish things, but, but trusted in him for all things, even unto repentance and turning from those things. I need to be humbled by my sin and I need to be renewed and strengthened in my faith. So that I might run this race with endurance. Not quitting at any point. It's just the continuation of what we've been seeing. Look back at chapter 6 just quickly. It'll be on the screen if you don't want to turn there. Chapter 6, be reminded of this coming in the midst of that great warning uh, that begin with, we have sluggish years and it's hard to explain certain things. At the conclusion of that warning in verse 11 and 12, this is what we're told. And we desire that each one of you same, show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. All the way through verse 12, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Welcome to chapter 11. These are the examples. These examples of old are not to be simply admired. They are to be imitated. Not simply admired, imitated. As we study these halls of faith in the weeks ahead, please, please consider their faith so that you too might be diligent and not sluggish in your own faith. We've seen briefly what faith is, what faith does, and the last point this morning regarding our faith is what is it in? What is faith in? And this is, a, this is probably, I think, the most important one, honestly. What is our faith in? Because many claim to have faith, and, and let me say this, and in fact do. They do have faith in the sense that they have an assurance of things they've hoped for. <laughs> they have a conviction of things they haven't yet seen. And they live standing steadfastly on the, this is faith. But what if it's the wrong thing? There are many who are assured and convicted regarding things hoped for and not seen. But having faith is not sufficient in and of itself. Having conviction and, and hope, <laughs> assurance, doesn't mean that it's right. It matters a great deal what that faith is in. Our faith in God is in God and His goodness and wisdom. And let me repeat that in case you missed it. Our faith is in God and His goodness and wisdom, not the earthly outcomes. This is such a struggle for us. <laughs> so many tell me they have faith. And what they mean as we have the conversation, as I talk to them, is I'm trusting in God to provide for all that I want. That's what they mean. People tell me they're trusting God by faith for this and for that. I'm trusting in him. I know he's going to provide. My faith is strong. My faith is real. It's, it's tangible. Here's how it's displayed. I did this this week and I didn't do this and I'm pursuing this. And I just know he's going to answer. And what they mean is they're trusting in God for the outcome they have designated and desired. And so they, for example, I, this comes up all the time. They'll say things like, man, I'm just, I'm having the faith of Abraham that in this trial, I'm going to do as he says, and there's going to be a ram in the bushes behind me, right? They're, they're saying, I'm confident that God's going to provide 
so that the outcome of this trial will be one that is pleasing to me. The outcome of this testing is one that is pleasing to me. And that's a wonderful story. I enjoy that story. It's, it has many, many truths that can, that can bolster our souls. Or they might say things like, man, I'm trusting that like Moses, God's going to part the sea in my life and, and make this clear. They're going to part the sea and, and God's going to do this. I'm, I'm trusting by faith. He hasn't done it yet, but I'm, my whole life is marked by faith that God's going to do this. That, that, that like David, I'm going down in the valley and God's going to guide the stone forward. <laughs> what about Joseph? You know, that one who was sold into slavery by his family to fulfill God's plan. What about his faith and outcome? What about John the Baptist? This who was most blessed of those born among women. John the Baptist went, went to prison, went to jail. He didn't like it. Right? He sent emissaries to Christ saying, are you sure you're the one? Because from where I'm standing, it doesn't look so clear anymore. I know that before I was even born, I was worshiping you in my mother's belly. But, but Jesus, that was a whole lot more comfortable than this jail cell. Are you sure you're the one? Jesus says, yeah, I'm the one, and you're going to get your head cut off. What? Where's the ram? Wait a second, God. Well, where's the, the Red Sea being parted? Where's the manna from heaven, God? What, what are we going to do? You're going to, by faith, trust in him who is good and righteous in all that he does. That's what it means to walk by faith. And we struggle because we've got some other picture where we want to only talk about Abraham and the ram. We don't want to consider these things. Paul and Peter, think about these guys. On multiple occasions, they were both released from jail by the supernatural work of God. Until that one time where they weren't. Right? Both of them executed. You see, faith is trusting God. Period. End. Period. It is trust in God. End of discussion. Look at verse 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not blow through this. I know we're out of time, but let's finish this well. By faith we understand. We understand what? It means we believe and accept this to be true. That God spoke and it came to pass. Whew. Just think about that for a minute. I don't know that there's a more hated truth about God than this one. God spoke and it came to pass. Wait a second. That really makes him God and nothing else we can ever do. Oh, we've created this and that and we've done these things. I remember the one scientist speaking to the Christian scientist said, well, we've now made, we've made humans out of, out of dirt and other things and the scientist says, well, who gave you the dirt? Right? God spoke to nothing, and nothing obeyed him. Right? When we think about this, this is faith. This is faith that God spoke, and it all came to pass. That we are trusting the creator of all. That we are trusting the owner of all. That we are trusting the Lord of all. Saving faith, it's faith in him. Right? This is what we need to understand. Saving faith is trusting him whether the lion's mouth is bound or not. That if by honoring him you go in the lion's den, then that's the best place for you to be. That you would rather be in the lion's den than outside the lion's den if that is where God has you. And for righteousness sake, you go to the lion's den. Whether he binds their mouth or not, because he doesn't always... And there are many, 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 many more whom he loved that did not have a bound mouth in the lion's den than the ones that he did. <laughs> he is the Lord of all. Saving faith is faith in him. And his righteous ones are those who live their lives by their faith in him. You see, this is the great struggle with knowing God. We always want to reduce him just enough that we grow a little larger. That's all we want. We don't want to be God, really. We just, we just want to... We just want to have a little better vantage point of who he is. And so we reduce him. We make him a little less. We, we negate that part of his word. We don't talk about John the Baptist in prison. We talk about Abraham and the ram. We just want to grow a little larger. We want to make ourselves a little bit less insignificant. We want ourselves to be a little bit more important. But that never ends well. 
We think we can reduce him just a little. Make him a little more palatable to others around us. A little more understandable. A little more reachable. And instead what we end up with is one who is too small to actually be God. One who is too knowable for anyone to actually worship and follow. And one who is so reachable that what we find is we're stooping down to where he is. (laughs) Remember Job. Remember Job when the Lord revealed and reminded who he actually is. In other words, in trying to establish our own faith, we lose it all together. Faith is not statistical. People say, I have faith every time I get behind the wheel of a car. That's statistical faith. It's not biblical faith. We'll see that more in the weeks ahead. It's not historical. It's not, well, it's worked out 80% of the time when people did this. It's historical faith. That's not saving faith. That's not the faith of Scripture. Faith is active and is living and it is in Yahweh alone. Is this your faith? Does your faith rest in Jesus and bring glory to the Father? Or is it about resting in your outcomes and bringing glory to you? Because that's not faith. As we embark in this journey into chapter 11, in the lives of those who have faith, is our faith like theirs? Is your faith being convinced in the mind of things hoped for in the state of being convinced of things not seen? Is it like the men of old's faith? Is it an accurate faith in the creator, the redeemer, the sustaining God of the Bible and his plans for you? Or is your faith all about wielding his power to the accomplishment of your plans for you? You see, one saves and the other does not. What I would say to you is whatever your faith is, it can be this faith. For he has made this faith known and he has made himself known so that we might trust him unto eternal life and salvation. Would you pray with me? Lord, you are worthy of our praise and you alone. We want to have tangible things that, that knock back our need for faith, things that we've accomplished, things that we can point to, things that we can say, look at me, look what I've done, look at how well I'm doing, but Lord, that's not faith. Faith is dependency upon you that our goodness would come from you, that our our deeds would be in light of you, that our lives would be by faith in you. Lord, that if you put us in the lion's den, we would rejoice all the way there, that we would stand before you and hear well done, that we have run our race with endurance and that that endurance came because of the faith that you have supplied and the examples that you have recorded. Lord, would we trust you in all things and in all ways, leaning not on our own understanding, but instead pursuing after you according to your word. Would we be your people in this way? In Christ's name, amen.